Two weeks ago, we discussed the idea that NVIDIA and semiconductors were finding their lows. Fast forward to today, and it's had one of the best runs in over 15 months. But is there another opportunity on the horizon? With gold breaking out, with the advanced decline line going absolutely ballistic that we'll talk about today, and of course, the Russell 2000 finding some strength, where are the opportunities for the weeks ahead? Well, one thing's for sure, it may not be exactly where you expect. Let's go through stocks, commodities, and cryptos, including the massive dark pool activity that we saw into the close this week. Guys, it's going to be a great one. Join us right now. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the special weekend edition of The Daily Show. My name's Tom. Today, we're going through, of course, the macro and the data, but it was, as a week in review, exactly as we suspected. Semiconductors pulled us up, positive gamma started taking over, and the bulls were back, which was exactly what the data really suggested would happen in light of a flash crash. More importantly than that, though, we started to get some sentiment reports coming in, which showed, again, what we would probably expect. Bulls remained pretty solid but we did get a lot more neutrality, which basically means people were sitting in cash waiting to deploy their money. Now, in those situations, when everyone wants to deploy their money, what does the market do? It often squeezes and pushes higher. And a big reason behind this was, of course, the CTAs, the Commodity Trade Advisors. We've been talking about how they were underperforming this year, and more importantly, how they panicked only two weeks ago, and now they've got to get back in because they have to follow the trends, and this is a big issue for them. And this could actually drive the markets to an all-time high even in the next couple of weeks, including, of course, one of those other important points, which is the buyback period is open on markets. But we do find ourselves a big resistance, so we'll take a look at that in a moment. The first story I thought we'd talk about this weekend, though, was this one here. From Goldman Sachs, you can see there is an expectation that we'll get a revision in payrolls. And this is courtesy of Mike Zaccardi over on X. And I want to just read this point to you. A large downward revision seems likely. We estimate on the order of 600,000 to 1 million jobs or 50 to 85,000 downward revisions to the monthly payroll growth over April 23 to March 24. I mean, how ridiculous can this number get? We talk about non-fund payrolls every month. We always talk about how in many ways it is literally fake news. And we tend to not try to interpret the number. Remember, follow the price action. And on this channel, we follow the technical analysis or the flows. We follow the data. And it's always very important that we take the subjectivity out of it and try to break down where the money is really moving. More importantly than this, though, it will look like a shocking number. But do remember the market already knows this and it will start to break down these types of charts. So this is an interesting one because, of course, it shows here unemployment rises gradually and then suddenly starts to spike up. And this is where we've started to get these rules, such as the SARM rule over the last two weeks, that's showing that a recession could be just around the corner. Now, if we take June 2023 to June 2024, we overlay it with prior recession periods from 1960 to 2008. And again, this is on our Twitter, following the links in the description down below or X account. And you'll notice over here that months relative to the start of a recession well, we're starting to look like we're in that type of period. But I would slightly caution this. I do think that this time is a slightly different. You might say, well, Tom, it's never different. It's always the same. It's always something problematic. And I think that this time we're going to go into a period where everyone's going to be calling a soft landing, saying we've fixed it. You know, it's, it's coming off record unemployment lows. So realistically, it's okay to come up and don't worry, we've fixed the economic system. Now, ultimately, as you may know, we believe we're in late cycle. So it's probably going to end up in a hard landing or a recession, but timing will be everything. So make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're interested in finding out more about our theories there and how we drive through to 2025 and into possibly the biggest problem year, which may be 26. Let's go through US markets and how they've been performing this year so far, though, because, of course, that is important. And it may not have looked so good for the NASDAQ, but now it does back into the 15, 17% after coming back. S&P obviously doing well. And a lot of people worried about transports. Notice here that transports year to date change down 1.42%. Now, if you're a Dow theory kind of follower, you would not like that number. Of course, it looks really bad. I would suggest, and I think we've all been talking about this together, that maybe use semiconductors over the original Dow theory as a bit of a gauge on how the markets are really going and how the economy is going. That can be a better read, and we'll talk more about that and how the Dow theory is most likely now broken 
when compared to the new semiconductor Dow theory concepts. Another thing that's interesting here is that the markets have not made new all-time highs yet, but we are starting to see some significant breadth increases. Have a look here, the advanced decline line. Make sure to put that on your S&P 500 charts, whether you use SPY or SPX or any of those codes. And where we are looking at very, very good numbers here, we've got the S&P 500 all-time highs here in terms of the advanced decline line. The New York Stock Exchange code, all-time highs. And the mid cap, so that's mid as a code, we are looking at only 2% off its all-time highs. So is that a market that's sick? Well, it's a market that certainly is showing the type of breadth that we want to be seeing. But I would say, look at this level here. If we're going to see a pullback before we go to an all-time high, it seems likely this would be the point that that would happen. We do have two significant gaps sitting just behind. And of course, we've been on an epic rally, seven days up straight for the NASDAQ. That's starting to get into those statistical facts that usually start to see what we call a pullback in time or a little bit of weakness coming into strength. Goldman Sachs are still looking at the two, the second quarter earnings and they're saying, you know what, we maintain that 2025 is going to be a good period. We maintain that the earnings per share is going to increase and we will actually be giving our ideas on what we think 2025 is going to look like. We'll do a bit of a call on that post the US election this year. So make sure to stay tuned for that one because we'll be giving kind of our crystal ball thought processes on what we think 2025 could bring us in terms of market growth or weakness or anything like that. Uh, yeah, stay tuned. It's going to be an interesting one. Let's go through S&P 500 Ford PE ratios. We know that we're trading above the overall standard deviation. Now, I don't like to use a 30-year average anymore. This one here is from, I think, JP Morgan. Generally speaking, you have to look at the last 10 years, and that puts us up at around 18 uh, average. Why? Because we're in the world of QE. We're in the world of concentrated big tech companies. And yeah, in general, is this a cheap market? Uh, no, it's not a cheap market. It's expensive. It got back underneath 20 for a little blip there last two weeks ago. But we do know that we're also in what we call an AI bubble. So while we're running this, remember, people are going to stop saying the word bubble and just say it's the new norm. That's when you want to be a little bit more terrified. Here's a comment from Google's ex-CEO, and uh, he isn't licensed to give financial advice, but he does think you should buy NVIDIA. According to this, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google until 2011, believes that basically NVIDIA is a boss company and it's going to do pretty well. He made it pretty clear that AI training chip vendor NVIDIA is a stock he thinks belongs in every portfolio. And he spoke recently and said that he believes that this particular company is so far ahead of some of its rivals. In particular, he's saying that AMD can't come close at this point. So I thought that was an interesting factor. AMD cannot compete yet with NVIDIA's dominant CUDA software. So this is an important factor. And I think we need to be considering that we have an NVIDIA earnings season coming up soon. When that stock comes out, it's going to be a blockbuster day because if it does perform the way that the market believes it will, Again, it could start to shoot to a new all-time high. If that happens, well, we know what happens with stocks. If it underperforms, well, we also know that's going to be bad. Really, this market is heavily driven by NVIDIA sentiment. Let's also have a look at the broad-based market. SPW or RSP, if you want to code it up, basically is showing the equal weight market is starting to look at that point where it's getting a little bit cheap versus the S&P. And we know that the Russell 2000 as well has taken a while now before it's even looked to be at a new all-time high. And that new all-time high will be important for the bulls. It can't just be driven by AI or driven by you know a few companies. We do need to see a broad-based recovery. And this the reason why this is realistically is because in 2025, Wall Street doesn't care about the big tech earnings. They're saying, oh yeah, they're already locked in. It's all good. What we're looking towards is where are the small cap earnings? And so far, the small caps have been doing okay, but they haven't. they've been revised down a little bit. So it's very important that small caps come through. Why? Because in generally in late cycle investing in particular, you can see here during the 18-19 period, the small caps had a good run and they made a new high after significant underperformance. You'll also notice if we go back to the 05-06 run before the global financial crisis, small caps broke out and then started into a pretty nice trend. So it is pretty important that happens. It's 694 days now since the last all-time high. 
So considering that, considering Tom Lee and other people are going hugely bullish on the markets, they're going to need those small caps to come along. Let's have a look at the S&P 1500 sector here. Thanks, Grant Hawkridge. A good guy. Follow him on X if you want to. Uh, basically, he's gone through and he's looked at the relative strength dashboard. And remember, there are a couple of things that tell us that we could be in late cycle. One of those has been utilities. We've talked a lot about utilities, but we also don't usually see financials doing so well or real estate doing so well uh, in an unhealthy market. So it is interesting to see financials up here. What that's telling us, and I think it's telling all of us, is that debt is being written into the economy. And remember, as we get more debt, as everybody's living a lifestyle they can't afford, as inflation, even though it's coming down, still has become persistent and still a problem, especially in shelter, we know that this will eventually go badly. And really, it's a ticking time bomb. Eventually, it goes off and we need to be paying attention to that. But the market is not buying utilities for no reason. One of the reasons, of course, is upcoming potential rate cuts. But the other reason is also because we're in late cycle. Expect healthcare to also be another interesting sector moving forward, especially post rate cut, which we'll talk in a subsequent video about, because I think you guys will find that interesting. Let's have a look at US systematic positioning. Now, we warned last week uh, about this. CTAs have been a big topic. We're seeing Bloomberg starting to talk about them. And this is CTAs plus risk parity plus vol control funds. And you'll notice that they dipped underneath the overall market. What does that mean? Complete panic. That is panic. Now, since the market's rallied back up, what do they have to do? And they've got to buy in. And that's creating this kind of feed-on effect that's gone into the positive gamma situation of the options market. And even though we're now at a resistance, and I do think there could be a little bit of weakness here, but it'd be interesting to see your comments down below, uh, it does look kind of positive towards the markets making a new all-time high. Big breadth, good VIX data, which of course we're looking at here, and of course this idea that the Fed is going to be accommodative in September to the market's concerns and give a 25 basis point cut. All of these things, while you know we all know that it's not really that great, again, they can create like a little bit of a flow on effect. And a lot of people are looking to an all time high. A lot of people are probably buying into certain stocks. So of course, we do need to be watching for these traps at this point. Now, in our opinion, when we take a look here at the VIX returns, we're looking at these particular ones, 97, 98, and 2018. So, you know, again, some of them were really, really good in the concentrated markets here. We're kind of looking at a 10, 15% kind of increase. That would be a pretty good number. Let's have a look at the expectations. Chance of now a double rate cut is down into the 20%, was sitting at like 50, 60% only two weeks ago. So these things change quickly. And do remember, we're tracking the three months, particularly after the first rate cut, to figure out whether we're in a recession path or we're in a non-recession path. And again, our opinion doesn't mean much, but market structure will be very important. If a 50 basis point cut comes through in September, that probably means the Fed is panicking and we've seen what happens there. If the last five cut times, 50 basis points have ended in recession, 25s have ended in better markets that then end up in recession. So just remember, again, the Fed is not cutting because it's all great. The Fed is cutting because things are weakening. That's just the nature of it. Wayne Whaley's data also suggests that we might be going in, and we've talked about this for a while, this idea of a doubling dip. So that doesn't mean a new low, but it does mean that during the buyback period, which we're in right now, maybe we see some strength in markets. Then what about this September 23rd to October 2nd point? Now, in all previous points where we had strong 10% Jan July's, then we had a bit of weakness in the first two weeks of August, we seem to have this weird period of time that we are coming into. So yeah, it'll be an interesting one to watch. For the earnings season for this week, not too much to go through. I think last week was probably categorized or the week that we've just seen end basically was China stocks coming out. And China stocks did pretty well. And I think that's an important factor when we look at the dark pool activity in just a moment. But we do have Pan W, we do have Snow, we do have Baidu, we do have Target, Zoom and a few other companies. So if you want to play the earnings, there's still plenty out there coming through. Now, I thought this was an interesting post. This one here is from Jason Gottford over on X. We often focus on Jason's stuff because I quite like it. And he's basically bringing in this idea that in 2009, we kind of got these types of articles coming through and we just saw an article very similar for, of course, China. And China has been suffering. It's been doing very badly. You can see here the market was horrific. It's gone through like a recession. 
down 70, 80 percent in some of these market sectors. And then it found that huge recovery, which, of course, we've talked a lot about this year. We were very bullish down the bottom and we remain instantly kind of like very interested in this level from a price action standpoint. So, again, there are some good signs, but let's have a look at some of the other signs here. And this is one of the ones that, of course, we all like to see if you've been following the channel for a while because it's a dark pool activity trade in junior gold miner 2x funds. Now, we do like gold. Uh, and the, one of the reasons is because we know that China and Russia and other central banks are buying it. We're in a currency war. I could rattle off 10 reasons why I like gold at the moment. We've been talking a lot about it going to $3,000 an ounce. And you can see here, it's been a bit of accumulation in terms of junior gold miners and stuff. It looks like somebody is trying to get some action there. And where else are they trying to get action? Well, there seems to be some massive trades going through some of the big Chinese funds in America. CQQ getting its largest trade in the last two years, a very big trade. I think it's actually the largest ever trade that's ever gone through CQQ. It's dark pool. Could it be a buy? Let us know in the comments down below. And we've also seen some more trades starting to come through, whether it's KWeb, CQQ, those two kinds of codes are getting something. Now, it doesn't mean that it's instantly a buy. It's all fantastic. It could be a sell. But when you combine it with price action, it does, you know, break down anything. There's always a risk involved in investing and trading. And you've got to just kind of put it and stack it in your favor. And then, of course, control your risks overall. Yeah, I know risk discussion is boring, but controlling it is very important, especially with what we've seen over the last two weeks with a flash crash and a VIX 65 you would never expect. Now, I do include the Wayne Whaley breadth thrust again in this video. I know you guys are sick of it, but I have to put it in because for new viewers, for maybe you yourself, if you haven't seen this before, it is very strong. It pointed towards seeing weakness over the first two weeks to one month. Well, check mark, we did that. And then it points towards strength from that point on, even if we think the economy sucks and everything. Yeah, it's got a 100% track record over a pretty significant data set. So Something that's cool. I do like Wayne's stuff. And of course, that's an interesting data point. Let's now have a look at how Friday ended up. And we know rotation was going into all the sectors you would want it to go into for a healthy market, except gold was obviously out big time. But we did see regional banks starting to improve, XLF starting to improve. And it was just kind of like up, down, and all around. Overall, the week, though, was very strong. Semiconductors, technology, gold, even consumer discretionary starting to bounce up thanks to Things like, uh, you know, really just seeing pretty good retail sales coming through. And in general, it was a defensives kind of, you know, not so strong and growth very strong. Let's get into the S&P 500 before we look at the CTAs and the options flow. And then we'll get into the rest of the charts. And we'll start off here with the S&P 500. Two gaps. That's the potential. And I think one of the levels that you want to be looking at this week is 53.50. And you might say, well, we've been so strong. Why would we sell off? I think that's the reason why you might sell off. Seven days up, remember, for the queues. So seven days, bullish, bullish, bullish. One of the better runs that we've had over nine days. And while we suspected to get a run like this, there were two key levels that we had to look at. Around this zone last week, and we saw absolutely no action structure towards weakness. And then, of course, we find ourselves exactly where we are right now. Now, let's see. Did we see any weakness throughout Friday? Well, a little bit. And uh, we mark this as the last major bear area. I have updated the options flow levels. But I think this is quite of interesting because look at 55.12. This level was the low of Friday's move. We've rallied back up, which I'd expect. That's fine. We need to, you can't stop a freight train straight away. You need market structure. But we now have a low, 55.12. Now, 55.12 is taken out and bears get control of that. They could then push the 53.50 narrative and the other gap fell. So both of those gap fill levels, I do think are open this week. And although the market remains bullish, and of course, if you're a swing trader or an investor or anything else, you really have no point to be concerned. This could still happen. I think it's a real thing that we'd want to be putting on the charts. Watch for the market flow. I would kind of like the futures market to make a new high during the Monday session before the US, then maybe see a sell-off. And I think this would be a healthy move in markets. It'd be what you'd really suspect after having such a huge thrust and massive breadth. The good signs for people that are looking for all-time highs, the breadth, though, that was very strong. Let's go through the positive GABA situation. Yeah, that is big. So you'll notice here that whether it's the 19th, whether it's the 20th, or even upwards to the 30th of August, we have a lot more calls in the market than we used to. And take a look at this positive GABA level, 55.50, 
four is where we kind of closed. But look at the 55.50, 55.80 zone. If the market does want to push higher and it gets through these areas, it's going to be a feeding frenzy. Why? Because of course we know CTAs are probably uninvested still, underinvested. They're going to have to buy in. And then of course, if it holds higher during the session, what ends up happening is it pushes that market up. That's the idea behind positive gamma. For the flip of that is of course that maybe some of the market makers might want to try to make some money on this premium and they might want to hold it under that price. But definitely positive gamma for the first two days of the week and we're right at that res point. So something to pay attention to. S&P 500 CTAs, this is keep in mind a few days delayed. Look at this, they had to start buying up. No surprises, again, we suspected this. And I do have one here for the NASDAQ. There's the NASDAQ one, also finding buyers. Now, it was a good week for our precious metals. Silver, excellent trade. Well done, guys. A few people not liking it in the chat, but remember, it's all about ratio. You guys need to think about ratio. Trades, who cares? It's not like I'm saying silver is the greatest thing since sliced bread and you have to, I like gold more than silver, of course. But the thing is, it's all about ratio trades. 26.50, very good. We now find ourselves at a much higher level than that. And CTA seem to be buying in. Copper, have we seen the turn price? We, of course, started to see this in price action for day traders last week. And gold, well, that's a little bit more delayed. But as we know, new all-time high, beautiful stuff on gold. Maybe the CTAs will be purchasing up in that one. Brent also improving, and we saw oil do that. But oil did drop as of Friday, and we'll talk about the market structure in a moment. Let's also go through Tesla, 220 pretty much achieved on the Friday. Exactly what we suspected, finding a bit of call resistance around there. And this week ahead, if we get through 220 again, positive gamma becomes a feeding frenzy. So 220 will be your most important point if you're a Tesla trader this week. And if you're an NVIDIA trader, it's 125. And we found ourselves right at that level as of the close. So 125 will be the key point. If we get through there, then it can feed up to 130. And again, positive gamma situation in the market. So we find ourselves at like what I would say are key resistance points for many of these stocks. 220 on Tesla, 125. You know, these markets are all connected. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Whereas there are some markets that are super far behind the rest of them, uh, including the crypto market. So just before we jump into the charts and we have a look at all the key levels that we should be watching right now, I wanted to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, which is Tiger Brokers. Now, Tiger Brokers, as you may know, have been sponsoring our channel for a while now. But one of the things that I like about them is they're always listening to our feedback. And again, you guys have asked and they've given it to you. Competitive pricing, they've reduced their overall fees again on both US stocks and ETFs and ASX stocks and ETFs. And they have a very handy way of converting currencies to, of course, US dollars and back and into other countries. Now, that's the very important point because, of course, that can be quite hard. It's on the fly and it's awesome. Now, also, if you want to trade US stocks, that can be hard, especially from the Asian area. And they now offer 24 by 5 with Tiger Trade. There's access of 9,500 plus stocks and ETFs, zero additional fees, and they are offering overnight trading hours. So basically, you're going to be able to potentially trade into your favorite US stocks without having to stay up past that midnight point, which is, of course, what I have to do for the last 15 years. It's pretty cool. They've won plenty of awards. Check them out. And for anyone else out there interested, Tiger Brokers have links in the description down below for many other countries as well. Okay, well, let's jump back into the charts and have a look at discretionary versus staples because, of course, this is showing us what we already suspected on the chart. Sideways action for quite a while. Retail sales obviously helping to push it back up this week, but it kind of shows us that late cycle concept. Remember, if you go back and you think about the late cycle of 1819, and you might say, well, there was not meant to be a recession in 2020. There was meant to be a pullback then. I'm almost positive of it. Remember, business cycles plus presidential cycles plus everything else made sense for that to have weakness, actually. But when we come back over to this, we can see that it is still sideways. So nothing to report there other than it kind of makes sense to the late cycle theory. US two-year versus 10 years actually driving away from the uninversion of yield which it hit for like a fraction of a second. I don't think we can count that as a recession indicator because it hit it for a fraction of a second. It wasn't really a proper close underneath or didn't even hold for a couple of days. But this is an interesting factor here. To be switching away from that, remember, means that we maybe have more time before there is a proper market crash recession. 
And I think that's important to factor in on our charts. Treasury is also doing surprisingly well considering yields were up a little bit. They were down on the Friday, but they're still holding pretty well. And what that's telling us is there is a certain level of risk out there. Remember, Warren Buffett, he didn't cash for no reason. Everyone is starting to form. These rich guys, they are starting to form cash piles because I think they don't know exactly the timing. But over the next year or two years, they're starting to see the signs of late cycle as well. The market's clearly pointing towards these types of things. And we'll talk about it more on this channel moving forward. US dollar, though, what's going on there? Well, US dollar started to weaken. Did it go through 102? No. Did it activate anything in particular? It didn't for us this week. But another red week, all the same. And it points towards maybe 101 coming sooner than later for the US dollar. So things starting to weaken off there. Copper, on the other hand, very strong, great trade this week. If you're wearing copper bullishness, uh, yeah, you got a pretty good risk reward kind of out of that. And it looks like it's kind of accumulating, getting ready to potentially break out that 4.2 level. Now, we know that 4.22 would be a huge swing trading uh, movement, and we've seen CTA start to improve it. So this is a super oversold market. To be real, copper absolutely hates rate cuts. So, of course, if we're going to get lots of rate cuts, copper usually weakens. It was, but now that's starting to turn with the retail sales and some of the other numbers. We'll see whether it can hold up. What about gold, though? Wow. Gold moved past 2,500. Of course, that puts it well on the way to that $3,000 magical number that we have. Um, And yeah, it's more of the same. We were talking about this being accumulation for a while. It's obviously been bulling up, kind of dull market, as you can see here, making these higher highs. You don't want to really short that. We've been very, very long and bullish on it. And that was a good weekly break. So it kind of signifies now that gold could continue upwards into 2600, maybe even. And one of the things that a lot of people do here, and it's certainly worthwhile paying attention to, is pulling Fibonacci's. Because of course, you know, you may be looking at extension fibs and some of those extensions, particularly the 1618, is quite popular. And that's going to push around a 2725 number. So I guess at this point, you've got to start saying, well, maybe this thing is literally starting to push some very, very big numbers uh, moving forward, maybe even 2800 if you take it to the high. So good numbers for gold, obviously a great weekly close. And you can't really say that's a negative read. That is certainly a positive read for that particular market. So pullbacks at this stage, you'd have to think are going to be met by bull demand. Another big winner was, of course, silver 29 up 2.38%. And that was a great week for silver. That puts a two-week silver move at 9.22. And a lot of people have a lot of problems with gold and silver. They're like, oh, it was a terrible investment for 10 years. Yeah, it lost a decade. It sucked for 10 years. Do you think I like gold over the last 10 years? No, it sucked. But the thing is, when something goes through a lost decade, when it gets smashed for such a long period, when you go into a currency war, and when you go into these types of things where money is literally devaluing all around us, There are reasons why silver and gold can do well. Now, silver, of course, is much weaker than gold. It's like used a lot in the economy. It is very susceptible to economic weakness, but still had a fantastic trade and actually hit the major target. Now, it hasn't closed above our very bullish level of 2940. That'll be for the swing traders out there, and that'll kind of point towards further strength. But I think we need to keep in mind that it did something significant only a few weeks ago, or maybe two months ago, and that was that it broke through $30. And that marks, I believe, a run that can go to 34.47. So something that's very interesting here, great weekly close, obviously not super bullish like gold, but uh, silver has catch up to do. What about US oil? A lot of people saying, oh, this sucks, US oil sucks. Yeah, US oil is very much a manipulated um, commodity. In this case, of course, we have an election year. We know that this is one of the hardest trades out there due to that. But we do now have, of course, our series of lower lows and lower highs. We were looking for a 79 breach to obviously give us that sign that it was wanting to go towards 83 a barrel. It didn't want to do that. It came down to a new low, and now we have the same highs. So what we need to be doing is waiting for this to really say it's ready to go bullish again. This is a great bullish signal. We believe there will be a buyer here on oil. We're seeing CTAs obviously starting to increase the market. Uh, but no signal yet. So we'll update on oil and Brent when we get any kind of update that's worthwhile. 220, Tesla didn't quite hit it. As you guys know, I never go towards the exact number. I usually go somewhere within 50 cents or even 10, 50 cents in with that. Uh, still pretty good though for Tesla. If we look at the weekly, we managed to close at a nice bullish level. Uh, from a daily perspective, 
We haven't been able to breach through 235, which obviously will be a turning point for Tesla bulls. But it's a decent little pullback, 220. We'll see how the options flow moves this week. And I think from that point, we might get a couple of trades. NVIDIA, well, it's uh, very strong. 125, we know that's where the calls are. We also know that's where that last kind of gap was. So this, along with, N- uh, with, along with the NASDAQ, along with the S&P 500, they're all at these kind of weird res zones. So nothing much to read into for NVIDIA. Now, what about HSI? The Chinese stock market had a pretty good weekly close on it. Very strong, going up to 17,430. It's a pretty good read. It certainly does start to show you that there's a turnaround story here. And it's kind of just like marginally broken through, which often people will use as a scale. You'll notice here we've got that left shoulder, head, right shoulder kind of concept. So that's an inverse head and shoulders. We've got dark pull activity all over the place on many of the funds in America. And clearly someone's trying to accumulate. Now, I heard Michael Burry's accumulating it. Don't know how I feel about that. But overall, we do have, uh, you know, pretty good sentiment and pretty good sentiment shift. Well, terrible sentiment, but pretty good price action sentiment shift. So this is uh, starting to look a lot better on the charts. US 30, we're in a resistance point, similar to the S&P, we're right at that point where if there's going to be a bear, even a pullback in time, this has to be kind of the zone that you would usually look for. Same thing with the NASDAQ, but let's have a look at the Russell. The Russell broke through that daily rejection. We suspected there would be a squeeze there, held pretty well through the Friday and closed a beautiful weekly. Again, starting to look good. Is it going to be Tom Lee's uh, 15% in August? I don't think it's going to do that, but certainly is an improvement. And targets for bulls here would be at minimum kind of like 2250. And if we ever get to 2430, remember that's not going to be bad for the next kind of six, four to six month run for the Russell. Let's move over the queues. We're left with two major gaps and we've had a massive run. As you can see, we've constantly been opening up and uh, then ended up kind of like bullish each day. So basically that's a, what, seven day run. It's pretty rare statistically. It's not impossible to keep going, but there is a lot of kind of stats and figures that start to point towards, again, pullback in time, sideways action, accumulation, that type of thing. Wouldn't be surprised to see some little bit of weakness here in the charts. And then we move over to Bitcoin. Wow, it's been bad coin. That's what we'll call it. But bad coin for a long time, been lagging gold. I actually posted over on X an interesting concept there that when gold has broken out in the past, Bitcoin's kind of floated for a while and then started moving with it. I don't really kind of believe that. But obviously with risk on, this is important because risk on does mean we can start seeing risk assets such as Bitcoin go forward. And I've got a little super bull level for day traders. This will be an important point. See how it comes and respects it. If it breaches through over the weekend, that could easily knock off this high get rid of that horrible 61.8 fib and then start to move towards the 68,000 level, which I guess would be the next kind of major target for this. So yeah, looking not bad in the structure. Ethereum, eh, it's kind of like the crappy version of Bitcoin at the moment. It's not as good. I mean, basically Ethereum should be here as Bitcoin is around that point as well, but it isn't. So 26.85, again, Ethereum tends to kind of lag Bitcoin then come through in a spurt after that point. For the week ahead, what have we got? Well, we've got a little bit of CAD news. Then we have some FOMC meeting minutes news on Wednesday at 2 p.m. So that'll be interesting. And then we get Flash PMI and the most annoying person is coming out later on this week, Fed Chair Powell. And he's coming to talk to us at the Jackson Hole Symposium. So really this week is about Jackson Hole. Markets have reacted kind of negatively before around this point. We'll bring some stats later on this week, just how that actually will play out. But for Monday right now, we're seeing whether this market structure can be stopped. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you're interested in finding out any more about what we do over at FX Evolution, you can check out our courses. You can follow us on X and, of course, check out anything else you're interested in. And a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, which is Tiger Brokers. Links in the description and pinned comment down below. And, of course, if you're from Australia... I've got you a little extra bonus as well. You get 30 bucks worth of Tesla, $30 cash voucher, and some other stuff. So it's awesome. Why not check them out? Give it a shot, guys. Bye for now.